little bit anxious to get up here and deliver this message this morning because God's been working on my heart in uh, a lot of ways to make this come alive. And uh, I'd like to invite him to do that for all of us this morning. Would you join me in prayer, please? Our great God, we humble ourselves before you. We thank you that you are God and we're not. We thank you that all the affairs of this world are in your hands. And you have placed us within the palm of your hand and promised that you will never leave us, never forsake us, never abandon us, never give up on us. Thank you so much, Lord. We pray that as we look at Daniel chapter 3 this morning, that you would help us trust you and depend upon you, not ourselves, not on others, not on human government, but on you to provide all that we need to make us more and more like your son. We pray these things in his name and for his glory. Amen. So if you have been alive and awake recently, you know without a shadow of a doubt that we are in that wonderful time of year in this part of Texas called hurricane season. And uh, every time you watch the news, you probably get an, uh, an update on all of the storms that are all the way from Africa into the Gulf of Mexico. And they're telling you, be prepared. Uh, make sure your car has gas in it. Make sure that you have food and water in your house. Make sure that you got a couple of cans of uh, gasoline in case you need to use a, or borrow a generator, right? I mean, it's everywhere. Uh, you see it on the signs on the freeway. Hurricane season, are you ready? Uh, even Pearland kind of joined Houston Transtar, right, in uh, putting a sign up outside of Kroger that said, it's hurricane season. Do y'all do y'all know it's hurricane season? And a, as if that was not enough to scare the liver out of us, having ridden through several hurricanes in this part of the world, uh, they're also warning us about the next strain of COVID and monkeypox and war in Ukraine, and it might go nuclear, and kind of a scary time, isn't it? Hurricane season, pandemic, all kinds of problems. How do you deal with that? There's battles going on everywhere. Where do you turn? And if that's not enough, there's battles going on inside of us, aren't there? Will I trust God? Is he going to be faithful? Is he going to show me his love and grace, or is he going to kind of let me hang out there to dry sometimes? And we, we're in church, so we can be honest about those kinds of things, right? Okay, one nod. That's, that's a good thing. But the reality is we live in dangerous times. But honestly, here in the U.S., we kind of live in a pocket that is very safe and very secure for Christians, but that's not the way it is in lots of places within the world. I looked up some statistics, and the, the last year from uh, October 2020 to September 2021, there were 5,898 Christians that were martyred because they were Christians. That's a lot of people. There were 5,110 churches or Christian organizations, facilities, attacked, destroyed, damaged. Right now, there are 4,765 people that are in prison without trial because they are Christians around the world. In the last decade of time, 900,000 Christians have been martyred worldwide. And you might be thinking, boy, this is a bummer, Bill. 
Why are you bringing us all this bad news? But my intention is not to scare us. My intention is to point us to what Daniel 3 has to say about preparing ourselves for difficult times. Because the reality is, if we are not preparing, like if we're not exercising or watching our diet or taking care of ourselves or getting enough rest, if something happens, we're not going to be ready for it. We're not going to be prepared. And even in the U.S. right now, isn't it true that righteousness is being accused of being bigotry and hate-mongering and all kinds of nasty stuff, and sin is, is being championed? Let's go for it. Why are we so angry or frustrated or difficult for people that are struggling in sin? So we live in dangerous times, and Daniel chapter 3 has some solutions to help us prepare. So join me there, if you will. Uh, we're going to look first at two things that appear to be positive to most of the human race, but they're really negatives in reality. And then we're going to see two things that look negative to the human race, to most of us at one time or another, but are really very positive. Things. So here we go in Daniel chapter 3. The first thing I'd like you to realize, and I'll give you a little bit of background, is, is that uh, Daniel was living in some pretty shaky times. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had invaded Judah. He really had a beef with Egypt, and he went down to beat up on Egypt, and he was successful. He conquered Egypt. And on the way back, he decided he'd stop in Jerusalem because Jerusalem had set up an alliance with Egypt to protect them. And when they were gone, there was no protection. And he invaded for the first of three times in 605 B.C. This time he, he breached the walls, he got into the city, and he said, okay, you guys owe me a bunch of money or I'm going to keep the fun up and destroy stuff. So they pay him. And he also takes a bunch of the royals and uh, educated people in that culture to take them back and try to convince them to be ambassadors for the Babylonian way of life. Uh, he also invades another time in 597, and finally in 586 B.C., he wipes Jerusalem and the Temple of God off the face of the planet. What a guy. Daniel and his friends are in the people that he took from Jerusalem to train. And the, the issue that we're going to look at first is something that we need to be sure we're avoiding. And it, it goes like this. Arrogance is an early warning sign of impending spiritual disaster. Avoid it in yourself avoid it in others, recognize it for what it is. It's an affront to the God who knows and can do all things for his own glory. If there is arrogance brewing in us or in anyone else, there's something dangerous going on. This danger shows itself. Now, you remember Daniel chapter 1? Uh, Tyler taught us that it had to do with food and diet and Daniel and his friends saying, we don't want to defile ourselves with stuff that our God's law says don't do. So rather than saying, we ain't eating, we're going to go on a hunger fast, we're going to die, he says, Let, let's have a test, okay? You feed us what we want and in 10 days look and we'll see whether we look good or our friends look good. And they do that and God provides and they are allowed to keep pure. In Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar is, is kind of fed up with his hired holy guys, and he, he's kind of thinking, apparently, that, that they're playing games with him. So he has this terrifying dream, and he says, okay, here's the deal. Usually I tell you the dream, but this time I'm not. You need to tell me the dream and the interpretation or you're all dead. All of the hired holy guys, all of the leaders in training are going to be executed. 
And uh, Daniel and his friends pray. God gives them the answer. He reveals it to the king. And the king actually praises God. He, he says, this God is the God of gods. He, he knows it. He knows what's going on. But then arrogance seeps in. I don't know about you, but anybody ever have a success and uh, a victory? Uh, uh, you know, maybe you won the Little League World Series or, or some big thing, and, and you found yourself standing in front of the mirror singing How Great Thou Art to yourself. Right? Because, man, when we got it wired, we feel very powerful, very strong, very capable. We are the champions of the world. And wrong answer. That kind of arrogance, even subtle in our lives, is a very, very dangerous thing. So Daniel tells, in chapter 2, tells Nebuchadnezzar, here's the deal. You saw a statue in your dream. It had a head of gold, it had a chest of silver, it had an abdomen of bronze, it had legs of iron, and its feet were made of clay and iron mixed together. And, uh, and then there was this stone that no man cut out of uh, a quarry, and it struck this statue, and the statue fell apart and went to dust and blew away, and it became, that stone became a great mountain. Here's the interpretation. You're the head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar. Your, your culture, your society right now is on top of the world. But there's going to be others that follow, and yours will turn to dust. And ultimately, what God is going to do is restore his control, restore his power, restore his grace over the whole, whole earth. But, but man has a shot at doing this, and arrogance is where this goes in Nebuchadnezzar. Listen to what it says, Daniel chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, and its breadth was 6 cubits. And he set it up on the plain of Dur in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the gov and the governors, and the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that the king Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now here's the tricky part. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the people in the peoples nations and languages fell down and worshiped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now that's arrogance, isn't it? You can say yes. Stupendous arrogance. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. God was showing him what would happen. He's the head of gold, but he says, look, I am the head of gold, but let's, let's just be real. I've got it wired. I know how to rule a kingdom. I know how to build one of the eight wonders of the world. I, 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 I. 
And uh, it doesn't say so in scripture, but you can almost see his head inflating. Right? I. He's thinking only of himself, and he's written God out of the picture. I. Now, it seems to me, as I thought and prayed about this, there are two different kinds of arrogance. The first is the kind of arrogance that Nebuchadnezzar has, where his eye is replacing God. I, I'm all-powerful. I know everything. I can make things happen. Uh, I'm that kind of a dude. I mean, they just don't make them like me. And, and that certainly is dangerous, but there's another form of arrogance that is just as dangerous, and it's the arrogance that goes in the opposite direction and says, God couldn't love me. I'm not even sure he could save me. I, I don't think I have anything to offer to him, and I don't think I have anything to offer to anybody else, really. I, for me, I'm just this dude from Philadelphia, living in Texas. Talk about difficult circumstances. I can't do anything. God doesn't want to use me. He, he doesn't even really want to know me. He just kind of puts up with me because I show up once in a while. And that really is just the same kind of self-centered rejection of God's truth that Nebuchadnezzar had, only it's going in the opposite direction. So the reality is arrogance can be a, a positive inflating thing or a negative deflating thing. But every time it shows up in Scripture, and it showed up here, and it's going to continue to show up in Daniel, arrogance brings problems. It facilitates the kind of setbacks, hardships, difficulties that we humans have. The solution is really found in not arrogance, but humility. So when Jesus comes, he's deity, right? We, we believe that he's God in flesh. He's Emmanuel, the God with us. Wow. Does it say, hey, everybody, I'm here. Bring it. Praise me, worship me. No, he takes on the attitude of a servant. This is the God that spoke the universe into existence, humbly coming as a servant who would give his life to bring us back into relationship with God. And all of the teachings of Jesus take the, the superficial obedience and say it's way deeper than that. It's way more important than what you think. It, it's not just following the rules. It's having a heart that exalts God first and humbles itself, whether it's in sin or service or anything, because the reality is, uh, let, let's take a vote. The reality is all that we have and all that we are is a gift from God. Anybody believe that? So, so where does arrogance come into us? comes into us when we push God out and say, you can't have me. I'm not going to serve you. I'm afraid of you. I'm concerned you're going to do something that's going to hurt me, so no way. Prove yourself, and then I'll worship. But Daniel and his friends take exactly the opposite approach. Let's, let's go on to the second point. So so the reality is, watch out for arrogance and invite God to continue to remind you that all that you are, all that you have, all that we are, all that we have, all that this church has, and all that we can offer comes from him, not from us. And with that kind of humility, God will be free to work in us. But there's a second expression. It's a lot more cowardly. It's a lot more subtle. Uh, let's look at it together. Uh, in chapter 3, verses 8 through 15, 
we see that go gossip, backbiting, and verbal devaluation of other people are cowardly means of either ap appeasing arrogance or exalting self. Don't throw your others under the bus, in other words. Listen to what it says. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Now, how many of you think kings live forever? I mean, it's pretty obvious this past week or so, right? Monarchs don't live forever. But let's, let's inflate this guy. Let's, let's feed his ego. Let's let him know we really think he's going to be around for all time. First kind of suck-up comment. You, O king, verse 10, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image, which is really an image of him, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, not to mention any names, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now the point here is that they're ratting out the guys who are over leadership of them. They didn't bow down. Now, apparently Nebuchadnezzar had no mechanism to, to recognize that. He has to have people come and tell him, there are people that aren't doing what you said to do. And we just want to be on your side and, and let you know who they are so you can throw them into the fiery furnace. And by the way, we'd be more than willing to take their place. They're throwing them under the bus. They're, they're inviting Nebuchadnezzar to execute them. And it has exactly the effect. Verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, fall down and worship the image that I have made. Well and good. But if you don't worship, you shall immediately be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Isn't that an arrogant statement? Not even God can get you out of this, dudes. You are going to burn to a crisp if you don't bow down and worship. Now, that had to be a terrifying threat to these guys. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar probably knew them. He had appointed them into authority. He had made them the rulers under Daniel of the province of Babylon, the, the capital area. He knew who they were. He knew what was going on. He knew the experiences and the power that God had, but he had exalted himself and become deaf to what God was trying to teach him. He couldn't see it. He couldn't hear it. He couldn't feel it. He couldn't sense it because he was inflated and he was deflating God. And really, honestly, any time that we exalt ourselves over others and we do it in order to judge or to condemn or to say, well, I would never sin like that or I, I would never think that way or I would never, what we're really doing is saying, I'm better than everybody else. 
And in that arrogance, can I, can I really step on some toes? We're Baptists. Yeah, and what does that mean? doesn't mean we humble ourselves before God. We recognize all that we are and all that we have is a gift from him. We are seeking to know him better and better and serve him from the purity of heart, not out of a desire to be recognized. Is that what that means, or is it our head expanding? And are we throwing other people under the bus, or are we seeing... These folks are are doing and saying and acting in ways that are going to lead to their destruction. God, help them. How can I be a witness? How can I stand firm? How can I make a difference? Okay, that's, that's the negative stuff. And it's really an occupational hazard of every human being. Do you, do you recognize that? You probably recognize it. Well, let, let me just say. Anybody realize it's much easier to see faults in other people than in yourself? Just ask your husband or your wife if that's true, and and they'll tell you, yeah, that's true. You never see any faults. You always think you're right, but you're not. Wow. That's what happens to human beings. We, We keep... Thinking, okay, I'm made in the image of God. He's given me gifts. He's given me abilities. And I can use them to exalt myself. Instead of, I can be humbled by God's grace and trust him to do what I can't do in this life. The two negatives. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego give us a different set of perspectives. The first one that begins in chapter 3, verse 16, is that they have pre-decided to respond to the trials, troubles, and invite God to develop their ability to keep his commandments. They pre-decide. They, they have made up their minds, we're not caving in. Now, if if you want to, you can go out of the worship center after we're done and walk over to the family center and peek in the blinds that are open on the office that I'm using. And on the wall, you will see a sign, a calligraphy sign, that says, pre-decide. That's what I'm suggesting we need to do. Now, here's the background for that. When I was in seminary, Uh, Sue and I started attending a Bible church with a pastor that had been here for lots and lots of years. And that, actually, before he was in that church in Dallas, he was in a church right down here off of Almeida Genoa and Cullen Boulevard. And uh, he had been in that church, and that church had grown. And, uh, but he didn't preach the way my professors were telling me you were supposed to preach. And I thought, this guy doesn't know anything. And I, I never learned anything from him when I had that attitude of, he's not doing it the way the profs tell us we need to do it, so he's got to be wrong. And then uh, I had got kind of tired of being in, in cemetery and... Uh, Sue's dad got sick, and we went back to Philly to kind of help out, and I worked in a church, and I was teaching on a regular basis at that church, and I realized nobody's listening to me. In fact, they get bored. They get bored with my preaching. How could that be, God? They must be rebellious. They must they, they must have hard hearts. They, there's something wrong. And then I realized the something wrong was not in others. It was in me. And I began to humble myself and say, okay, God, I think I'm all that in a bag of chips, but 
I'm really trash unless you are controlling me. And when we went back after Sue's dad had passed, we went back to Dallas and I finished seminary. And it was amazing how much better that guy preached after I changed my heart. How much I learned from that guy. I've got one of his sayings, predecide, hanging in my office, along with three others that were common for him to encourage his flock to practice. Predecide. Obviously, Daniel, Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, had said, we can't worship this God. We can't cave. We can't fold. We know it could be our lives, but we, we're not doing it. Listen to the, the text. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king and said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. That's a predecided commitment, isn't it? We're not going there. We don't have to think about it. We already decided. We will stand for God and God alone. And you can try whatever you want to try with us. And even if you're successful, we're still not going to do it. They predecided. So what kinds of things could you predecide right now? Let, let's start with the kids. Kids, uh, if you're not a teenager, you're a tweenager or younger, what can you predecide right now that will keep you from falling into danger or harm? And if you're wondering this, you might want to ask your parents afterwards. But are there things that kids can start thinking and feeling and pursuing that are dangerous to their spiritual lives? Absolutely. Can you predecide? I don't want to go there. I want to know God. I want to serve him. I want to be a part of what he's doing, and I'm not going to cave in. Predecide to do it. And then watch how God provides for you. How about teenagers? Anything teenagers face these days that are dangerous, life-threatening, could end up ruining the rest of their lives? What do you think, guys? Anything going on? That is dangerous for you? Yes. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to cave, be popular, go along with all the friends, uh, party, drink, take drugs, have sex? No problem. It's all okay. They say so on the news. No matter what we do, it's okay. No, it's not. We decide. Don't go. How about adults? Anything we can predecide? Yes. I'm going to choose, no matter what the cost, no matter what the consequences, no matter what the threat is, I'm not going to sacrifice my relationship with God to please man. And even if we lose our life doing it, will gain favor with God. Isn't that what uh, Joe read a little bit earlier from Hebrews? These guys were tortured. They, they ran about in the wilderness. They lived in caves and, and were destitute because they were looking for something that wasn't here yet. They were looking for the city whose author and found, founder were God. And they said, ain't here yet but we know God's going to bring it. And they were faithful. And it says, the world was not worthy of them. I think we need to decide in these days to live that way, to say the world is not what controls us. The world is not what we think, what we feel, what we pursue. 
In, in fact, it's probably an obstacle to all of that and predecide to live only for Christ, regardless of the cost. Now, of course, this kind of thing can be a little bit on the dangerous side. It can backfire. It can, it can go south in a heartbeat. And that's exactly what happens for these guys. But not only do you predecide, but you choose to trust God in whatever circumstances you're in. He will be faithful. He will come through. He will show me his plans, his purposes. He will bring them to pass. And if he protects me or if he brings me into his presence, it really doesn't matter. So let's pick up the action, chapter 3, verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace to be heating, heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and ordered some of his mighty men in the army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fire. These men were, were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their out, other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace because the king's order was urgent, and the furnace overheated. The flame of the fire killed the men who took, Shadrach, who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace furnace. So I'm presupposing that this furnace was for smelting gold. So I looked up, what's the temperature that gold melts at? Engineering background, got to know the facts, right? It's, it's just under 1900 degrees. Anybody have an oven that goes to 1900 degrees? Not even close. And if that was the regular temperature, I don't know how they measured it, but if that was the regular temperature, what was heated seven times that? 14,000 plus degrees? That's hot. I mean, you know it, it's not just going to hurt. It's going to consume you almost instantaneously. And they say, we don't care. We're trusting God, not you. And you're boasting that not even God can get us out of this, but we're going to trust him anyway. I love what happens. Verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Now in the reverse standard version, uh, it would read something like, Whoops, made a mistake. Thought God couldn't do something he can. Thought he wouldn't provide in a way he did. Ah, I am not all that in a bag of tricks. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Now notice he doesn't, invite the fourth guy to show up. Did you notice that? Like, yeah, that dude's a little too scary. I know these are just human beings, but something's going on with the fourth guy. And I don't really want to meet him face to face. Let's leave him in the fire. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, prefects, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. 
The hair on their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. There was no smell of fire that had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's commandment and yielded up their bodies rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. There is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. And then he promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Not only did they predecide, but they trusted and lived through the circumstances to glorify God, and they brought this king another step closer to the God of the Bible. And isn't that what we're supposed to do as well? Isn't that our goal? to love God and love others in, in such a transparent and relational manner that they'll see in him, in us, and ask us, what's going on with you? You're not like other people. You're not after exalting yourself. In, in fact, you keep saying you'll do stuff that I don't want to do. I'd rather hire it done than do it. But, but you're not that way. You are willing to to serve, and you're willing to sacrifice, and you're willing to give instead of get, and you're, you're willing to worship the true God rather than your own ambition, your own desires, your own wants, your own needs. So the positives, obviously, avoid arrogance. And when you see it in yourself or you see it in others, graciously challenge it. Let God correct that. And don't throw other people under the bus. Recognize they're just as needy as you are, just as needy as I am. We all are growing in our relationship with God. It's not that any of us have arrived. And if you think you have, you're wrong. I mean, sorry to break that news, but we're wrong. We won't be fully there until we're in his presence and made like him. But for now, we can say, I'm going to predecide who is God in my life, and it's not going to be me. And it's not going to be the opinion of other people, and it's not going to be what I hear on the broadcast and the news. And, and I'm going to heed warnings, but I'm going to heed God's warnings, not other people's warning. I'm not going to be afraid of what other people say. And I'm going to entrust myself to God. Now, when you came in, you got hopefully one of these little packets. If you didn't, and raise your hand, I'm sure somebody will get you one. We're going to share communion together. And before communion, uh, Paul exhorts the Corinthians in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that there needs to be an examination of self before we share the Lord's table together. So I'd like to suggest that we examine ourselves along the lines of Daniel chapter 3. Uh, is there any arrogance, any self-righteousness, any uh, sense that I'm better than others instead of I'm just like them? And, and if I am further along in my walk with God, it's just by his grace, not by my activity. I'm just learning to trust him and not trying to do things myself. And I'm not exalting myself by making other people look bad, by ratting them out, by throwing them under the bus. I, I pray for the people who are stuck, who are trapped, who are enslaved to that kind of thing. And I, I'm predeciding whether I'm going to live for God or myself, whether I'm going to live for God or my bank account or my reputation on the job or my success or my play toys, they don't count. God does. 
And finally, when it's all said and done, I'm going to stand before God and the, the one who died for me and hopefully hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So let's take a moment and invite God to examine us before we remind ourselves and one another of all that he has done at the Lord's table. Great God, we acknowledge to you that you alone are God. And we invite you to purify us. If there is some form of selfish arrogance within us, if there is some attitude of self-righteous judgment upon others. If we haven't predecided that we will live and serve only you, but get influenced by the ads on the television, the suggestions on the social media pages, on the things that this world offers rather than walking with you. Would you point those out to us? And Father, would you help us realize that our spiritual growth and development isn't on the basis of our effort, our works, our willpower. It's all wrapped up in our ability to trust you, not ourselves. And would you help us to celebrate that, to enjoy that, to live in that reality? So that you will be glorified, your name will be exalted, your nature will be revealed to those around us. We pray this in Christ's name. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, For I delivered unto you that which I also received from the Lord Jesus Christ. And on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. <clears throat> For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for all that you have done, all that you are doing, all that you will do for us in Christ. If we need to make some decision, if we need to turn from some sin or selfishness, uh, Lord, help us to encourage one another to be your people. Living in a world that really is yours by creation and by redemption. 
a world in which ultimately your kingdom will be established and every tear will be dried, every wrong righted, everything made new. We love you, Lord, and thank you in Christ's name.